Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Hello and warm Pacific greetings to all of our listeners this evening. Welcome to this webinar designed to inform health professionals about what the Cannabis Legalisation and Control Bill is, what it could mean for people of New Zealand and what we may wish to consider when casting our vote for the referendum. I am Dr Shelley Thompson, a GP from the Wellington region, and I will be your moderator this evening. This webinar grew because we wanted health professionals to have an opportunity to hear from the experts on the subjects of cannabis, including a breadth of opinions and perspectives, so that our votes will be well informed for the upcoming referendum. It is natural for us all to have accumulated biases regarding cannabis over our lifetime. Our own experiences, our peers, our family are likely to have all contributed to our opinions. This evening, I encourage listeners to recognise and acknowledge their own bias and try to put this one aside as you listen. Listen instead to the panellists' viewpoints and use their knowledge and expertise to reflect on your own beliefs. It is likely we will need to weigh up a broad number of determinants of health and well-being when making our decision on voting day. I have asked each panellist to refrain from telling listeners which way to vote, but to instead offer their experience and knowledge to help inform us. Please respect each voice and share in my gratitude for their presence today. To help officiate this webinar, I'd like to invite Associate Professor Kylie Quince, Ngā Puhi, Ngā Tiparo, Ngā Kahungungu, to share a karakia. Thank you, Kylie. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa, um, ngau mai hari mai ngā hau e whā e mā takitaki ana te kaupapa o tēnei pō, uh, ka ino e tātou. Uh, whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā taratara te ki tai, e hi aki ana te atākura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu tīhei mauri ora. Kia ora. Kia ora, Kaili. This evening we have six speakers and a seventh panellist to join us for the Q&A session. We have given speakers a mere five minutes to communicate their message to us. We recognise this as a very short time, so I'll go ahead and introduce our first speaker. A partner of the law firm Watton and Kearney, Adam Holloway is a lawyer regularly instructed by the Medical Protection Society. Adam, please tell us what we need to know about this referendum. Good evening, Shelley and everyone. What I'm going to do uh, with my lot of time is just uh, share the screen so I can rush through a quick few series of slides to speak to. So the referendum question that we're being asked to consider at the general election is, do you support the proposed cannabis legalisation and control bill? And that's a, it's a draft piece of legislation, so it's certainly subject to change. It's a set of ideas, not, uh, as with the End of Life Choice Act, a finished piece of legislation that will either be come into force or not come into force. So you'll be asked to say either yes to that or no, which of course brings into play the status quo, so that we have a counterfactual or a, another set of um ways of dealing with the issue of cannabis that we're choosing between. So I want to touch briefly on that status quo before turning to the, the draft legislation. At the moment, uh, cannabis is dealt with in, in three separate ways for medicinal, uh, the use by patients who are terminally ill, and then the recreational use of cannabis more generally. Uh, there is a medicinal cannabis scheme that's quite new. It came into force in 2019, and I, I won't dwell on it because, in essence, this is not proposed to change by virtue of the referendum. The current set of rules for medicinal cannabis will remain outside of this draft legislation and, and stay the same unless a future government decides to revisit them. At the moment, uh, there is a defence to the use of, or the possession of, of cannabis if you are a patient um, who is uh, undergoing palliative care. So that, that's a current setting that we have in the country, but that will fall away, of course, if cannabis undergoes a more general legalisation and, and won't be as relevant anymore. So what do we have for 
uh, recreational cannabis, which is the main game, I've described it there as decriminalisation light. It's certainly not decriminalised, but uh, under this last government, there's been a push to try and reduce further the extent to which prosecutions will follow for simple possession uh, and low-level recreational use. So the law is quite clear that there is a discretion uh, to prosecute for the possession of cannabis for personal use and that a prosecution should not be brought unless it's required in the public interest. And then there's a further direction uh, to bring to bear whether a health-centred or therapeutic approach would be more beneficial to the public interest before a prosecutorial decision is made. Uh, nonetheless, as I said, we are not in a uh, decriminalised context at the moment and there are potentially quite heavy penalties, particularly for uh, cultivating or dealing cannabis. So that brings us, that's the, the status quo, that's what we have and what we're choosing between is that and the uh, Cannabis Legislation and Control Bill. Now, as I've described it, it's a, it's a draft piece of legislation this is a non-binding referendum, so if there is a yes vote, then it will still be up to the government of the day to go ahead and introduce either that bill or some different bill into Parliament. Uh, under the current, trying to find what the various parties have said, uh, under Judith Collins, it seems a little unclear, but nevertheless likely that the National or National Act government, if we had one, would introduce this bill and more certain that it would happen under uh, Labour or Labour Greens if there's a yes vote. So the bill can change. Uh, it can change both uh, in its the finalisation of its drafting, because it is a it is still a draft, so the process from there to getting in, in a form in which it can be introduced to Parliament, it may change, and there are some details still to be completed. Uh, it would then be introduced and moved through Parliament in the usual way. So referred to select committee, there would be the opportunity for public input and the potential for further refinement as it goes through. It's also a little unclear to, to me, but I, there may be other experts who are closer to this who can speak whether uh, at, the, at the end, if we do get a bill going through Parliament, um, whether MPs will be whipped by their parties or ultimately have a... Uh, conscience vote to pass uh, final legislation. So what, uh, what the draft bill currently proposes, subject of course to any changes that may happen if it is introduced, is what I've described as, as true legalisation rather than decriminalisation. So in the spectrum of different policy responses, that's where I see it sitting. So a person who is aged 20 or over would be able to buy um, go into licensed premises, consume cannabis at home, um, share cannabis with other people over the age of 20 in an appropriate setting, and grow to cannabis plants. For people who are younger than 20, uh, the use of cannabis would be prohibited, but it is a decriminalised response. So uh, for someone under 20 who's bound with cannabis, the uh, the regulatory response to that would be health-focused, perhaps a fine, but not a criminal um, prosecution. Uh, the draft bill is quite a lengthy piece of legislation, and that's because, as well as that starting point of, of legalising the use of cannabis in certain contexts, it then goes on to endeavour to relatively comprehensively regulate and control all aspects of the supply chain for cannabis. So uh, you'll find there in the bill um, a lot of proposed rules for the licensing of growing, selling, uh, a production cap for the overall market every year, um, rules around premises, etc. Uh, some cannabis products would be prohibited, so particularly some sorts of consumables or uh, cannabis put into the eye. There would be a regime of taxes and levies so that the regulatory system was uh, largely self-funding. And then there would be an authority established to oversee all of those rules and an advisory committee to have policy input. So uh, in 
the short amount of time, uh, and I haven't been looking at my clock, uh, Shelley, so hopefully... Just summarising now, thanks. I'm still okay. Uh, some questions that occur to me uh, is, you know, what are the problems with the status quo? And, for example, as a lawyer, one of the problems that we get concerned about is a system that relies on prosecutorial discretion, which is the reality at the moment, because there's always a concern about whether... Uh, groups within society will um, receive the benefit of that discretion equally. Uh, on the flip side, thinking about the bill, um, it, it's obviously imagining a future we don't have. And so um, in my mind, there are questions around whether the bill will achieve its status, stated statutory purpose, which includes eliminating the illegal supply of cannabis uh, restricting young people's access to cannabis and then perhaps most importantly um, whether it will fulfil the objective of reducing overall harm. Thank you. Um, yeah. That's some good stuff to think about and hopefully we'll get some more information from our next speaker. So next up we have Professor Doug Selman, a psychiatrist and addiction medicine specialist and recognised leader in the addiction field in New Zealand. He runs a private practice while continuing research, teaching and advocacy through the University of Otago Christchurch. He has been involved in a broad range of addiction-related research projects with over 100 peer-reviewed publications. He was also a member of the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisory's expert panel. Welcome, Doug. Thanks. Thanks, Shelley. Kia ora koutou. Um, I come to this um, wanting to look at cannabis through the, through, through the lens of alcohol, which by far is more important as a, as a drug uh, than cannabis. Um, we, we've evolved with, with two uh, primary neural systems. We're, we're different to squid, uh, who only have an opioid system. We have both an opioid system and a cannabinoid system in human beings and, and, and mammals. Um, these, these two neural systems mediate pleasure and comfort. In, in, our, in our nervous system. And so it's not surprising that there are, there are two drugs, alcohol, which primarily is acting in terms of pleasure and comfort on the opioid system, and cannabis, which primarily acts on the cannabinoid system. It's not surprising that we've got these two drugs uh, as one and two in, in New Zealand. But um, we've all been somewhat brainwashed, let, let, let's say socialised, into thinking that alcohol essentially is good and that cannabis is bad. Um, the marketing of the alcohol industry has all lulled us into thinking that alcohol is not even a drug, whereas the rhetoric from the war on drugs, begun, which began in 1971 through President Nixon's declaration of war on drugs, and we've, we're the recipients of a, a sense on, on drugs other than alcohol. So all of us have a natural propensity to underestimate the harms from alcohol and overestimate the harms from cannabis. Um, I've recently had an editorial published in the New Zealand Medical Journal in which I looked at the evidence of harm on 13 different uh, dimensions comparing alcohol with cannabis and found uh, that alcohol is more harmful than cannabis on nine of the 13 and distinctly more harmful on seven. The, the key things are overdose. Uh, it's virtually impossible to overdose on cannabis, whereas it's relatively easy, relatively easy to overdose on alcohol. Uh, the neurotoxicity of, of alcohol is well known. Um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is a disgrace in New Zealand. There is no fetal alcohol cannabis a fetal cannabis spectrum disorder uh, in, any, uh, in any way comparable with FASD. Although um, women who, who use cannabis in, in utero are putting uh, other harms, but nothing like the neurotoxicity. Um, the aggressiveness of alcohol far outweighs, and in, and in fact, the evidence shows that cannabis decreases aggression. We have a major problem with aggression through alcohol in New Zealand. And finally, the carcinogenicity, THC, uh, is not a carcinogen, whereas 
ethanol, that's alcohol, is classified by the World Health Organization as a group one carcinogen. Um, so if you're thinking of voting no on the basis of harms from cannabis, then to be a rational person, you've got to be doubly energetic about advocating for the prohibition of alcohol. Um, but of course, we're human beings, so we're not necessarily all that rational. But anyway, um, the way I'm, I, I see it from a legal perspective, and, and thanks, Adam, for, all, for, for that, that, uh, that, that information, really good. I see us uh, operating our drug policy from the two extremes, large scale uh, commercialization of alcohol at one extreme and prohibition at the other. And that's where we've placed our two main drugs, alcohol and cannabis at the current time. There are three options in the middle, a, a strong regulated private enterprise as, as is being proposed by the government. Secondly, a state owned enterprise and thirdly, decriminalization. Um, the government has chosen for a strongly regulated private business model. Um, and looking at this from the point of view of alcohol, it would be great to have a, a model like this for alcohol, which is no marketing, um, R20, limited access, attention to the pricing, and with all the focus on, on this being potentially enacted in New Zealand, a, a careful look at what's happening on, on, in terms of driving. The biggest concern I have about this is that over time, big business could take over. And I can understand why people would vote no, because they are scared of big business taking over cannabis. But in my mind, even if the worst happened, and we got large scale commercialization of cannabis in 10 years time, creating an idea that smoking cannabis is cool, um, which is potentially uh, possible. Even if that happened, we wouldn't have anywhere near the harms that we've got from alcohol at the current time because cannabis is safer than alcohol. Um, the thing that- Come on, is now, thanks, if possible. I've, I've got one more sentence. Sure. Oh, um, uh, we've got soft decriminalisation at the moment, I know, but essentially we're in a, a prohibition model. Um, the thing that has swayed me, and I, I would describe myself, and in fact I voted today, I'm a reluctant yes uh, on the legislation. There are somewhere between 320 and 480 New Zealanders uh, who are currently um, criminalised for using a drug that's safer than alcohol. Um, and, and this criminalization is disproportionately affecting um, uh, disadvantaged people and Maori in New Zealand. So in the end, I'm, I'm seeing this more as a human rights issue and I'm feeling like I felt at the time of the homosexual law reform bill. I'm not a regular, regular user of cannabis, I'm not gay, but I'm thinking of my fellow citizens who are criminalized for being involved in, in those, those activities. So thank you very much for the- Thank you so much, uh, Doug, for that summary and that short space of time. Moving right along, we next have Dr. Mary Daly, a GP with over 30 years experience, currently practicing in Papakura, and also working as a college medical educator for the Royal New Zealand College of GPs. Mary has connections with the Note for Dope campaign and is going to share some of the reasons she has concerns about legalising cannabis in New Zealand. Welcome, Mary. I'd just like to pose two questions. Number one, does marijuana cause harm? And definitely it does across the board. They said fertility experts advise that cannabis use is linked to male subfertility and that the partners of male users have a doubled miscarriage rate. Pregnant users have higher rates of low birth weight, premature and ill babies requiring neonatal care. Children of mothers who use marijuana in pregnancy have 50% higher autism rate in their children as well, as well as additional neurodevelopmental problems. Research looking at maternal marijuana use, and this was 12,000 children in the NIDA study, showed that 19 and 11 year olds are displaying symptoms of psychosis, including hallucinations, paranoia, delusions and fragmented thinking. 
young people, that's children, teens and young adults, are more likely to experience harms, but the following also applies to adults as well. There's an increased risk of psychotic episodes, and this is in people with normal brains who are not predisposed in any way to mental health pathology. And that's been shown in at least 15 studies and lab settings. There's an increased risk of schizophrenia. Daily use increases the risk, and this is on 10% THC products, and there's a much, much higher potencies available today. The use of high-dose products increases the risk of schizophrenia times five. If a patient presents to ED with a marijuana-induced psychotic episode, the conversion to schizophrenia is 25 to 40%. There's an increased incidence of anxiety and depression from mid-20s and upwards. Marijuana abuse, substance abuse disorder, addiction in other words, is a known phenomenon. There's an increased rate of other substance abuse disorders in daily marijuana users. Vaping high-dose products, which can deliver 70 to 90% THC concentrates, are associated with death and hospitalizations. And this, there is a new, uh, newly found form of lung disease caused by vaping THC, where recently a 17-year-old needed a bilateral lung transplant. The um, associated consequences of cannabis abuse include workplace accidents, and there are new conditions presenting to EDs overseas Cannabis vomiting, cannabis vomiting syndrome, which is an unpleasant combination of screaming and throwing up. Second question, does legalisation reduce harms? Because this is the argument for legalisation. And I think we're fortunate in New Zealand that we can look at the data in places where cannabis is legal and see if this is the case or not. In summary, every harm is worse, not better. Examples are based on statistical data from US states where cannabis is legal, as well as Canada and Uruguay. There's increased marijuana driving related accidents and fatalities, increased ED visits, hospitalization, and accidental exposures. In home where adults are using legal product, there has been a marked increase in calls to poison centers, most often for children, 112% increase in Colorado, 140% in Massachusetts, 103% in Washington. The hospitalization rates increased in Colorado, 101%, and in Alaska, 45%. There's increased adolescent use compared to non-legal states. And for past year and past month use, increased small amount, but it's still an increase, 4 and 3% respectively. Very recent data from the Healthy Kids Colorado survey showed an increase of 14.8% of marijuana use in 15 and under year olds. Increased numbers of young people are using very high cannabis products in the form of dabs and vapes with potencies up to 90% plus. There's increased use in pregnancy. A study showed um, that seven out of 10 legal dispensaries offered and suggested cannabis products for pregnant women. There's increased access of dope to children. They don't need to leave their home to go and get it if their parents are regular users. There's increased diagnosis of cannabis use disorder in young people. There's no reduction in black market supplies. Gangs and others can undercut legal suppliers and provide high potency product. Illegal suppliers outsell legal suppliers three to one in California. Illegal suppliers set up shop amidst legal shops, and it's very hard for law enforcement to uh, do anything about that. There's no increased product safety. In legal states, up to 30% of product in legal dispensaries was contaminated by things such as herbicides, benzene, and rat droppings. Equality and equity far greater numbers of dope shops set up in lower socioeconomic areas. Despite being legal in the state, over 64% of local communities in Colorado have refused to allow marijuana shops to set up. And in California, 80% of local communities have denied access to legal shops. What is apparent is that communities most at risk have a higher number of shops. It's therefore putting populations most vulnerable with a disproportionate uh, concentration of harms, and this is hospitalizations, normalization. Five minutes, please summarize. Okay, um, in summary, harm, it's a harmful substance. There's no evidence thus far that legalization reduces those harms. And as doctors, we should look at the data from other countries and states where it's legal, look critically at the outcomes before agreeing that legalization is a good thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Some big things to think about, and perhaps we'll be able to have some response um, to that later in the piece. Next up, um, I just want to move on. When considering the implementation of a new law in New Zealand, it is important we hear voices of tangata whenua. 
Improving Māori health outcomes remains a focus for the Ministry of Health, but what are the determinants of Māori health and what impact could the legalisation of cannabis have on Māori? To help give us some perspective, we welcome back Associate Professor Kylie Quince. Kylie is Associate Professor at, of Law at AUT and specialises in criminal law, youth justice and Māori legal issues. She is Deputy Chair of the New Zealand Drug Foundation. She was also a member of the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisors Expert Committee on Cannabis. Welcome back, Kylie. Uh, kia ora, Norm. Um, so this is a bit like speed dating, so I'll keep to my five minutes, hopefully. Um, so I would agree, of course, that there is no doubt that cannabis causes harms, but uh, as you've mentioned, Shelley, those determinants uh, of health, uh, we're not talking just about health-related harms, but also justice, education and social harms, many of which uh, directly stem from prohibition uh, itself. And Māori suffer disproportionately from every, in every one of those categories of harm. So first, um, accounting for some differences in, uh, in use rates, Māori are still twice as likely to suffer from cannabis use disorder, meaning problematic uh, usage that's likely to require some kind of treatment or intervention. Uh, but the deprivation index also shows that Māori are more likely to live in areas, uh, as Doug mentioned, where it is more difficult to access treatment and general health infrastructure and services. Legalisation can shift that. Uh, for one, there's some evidence that Māori, uh, that people are less likely to seek help for problematic use uh, when a substance is illegal. Also, the proposed bill um, not only has a harm reduction focus, but of course part of the tax, uh, excise tax that will be garnered from a legal market is to be placed back into addictions uh, services for people who use problematically. Notwithstanding that the overwhelming majority of people that use cannabis do not use it uh, to problematic use levels or have any particular uh, adverse effects. In relation to the deprivation points, particularly the case for Māori that who have, many of whom have intrusive relationships with many state agencies, including Kainga Ora, public health authorities, Oranga Tamariki, and the prohibi prohibited, sta prohibited status of cannabis means that agencies can respond very harshly if illegal drug use is brought to light. So the stigma of an illegal substance may also affect people seeking assistance, so it drives problematic use underground. And the justice sphere, as we've heard uh, briefly, prohibition has and continues to have most impact upon Māori, uh, despite moves to de facto decriminalisation 20 years ago and the move to what Adam has described as decriminalisation light in 2019. Uh, those shifts have had very little effect uh, on Māori, who still remain three times more likely to be convicted uh, and uh, charged and convicted for possession and use uh, of cannabis. And a handful of people are still imprisoned solely for possession or use of cannabis with no further uh, criminal charges. Legalisation will stop those statistics in their tracks. They'll put Māori on the same formal um, equal legal footing as all other citizens. So a vote, in my view, a vote no, uh, is a vote to continuing to turn a blind eye to racist enforcement uh, of drug law uh, in Aotearoa. Prohibition also uh, contributes to education and social harms for Māori. The collateral consequences of um, criminal convictions for, uh, cr for cannabis use and possession uh, is seen in relation to um, obviously seeking and uh, maintaining employment, travel opportunities, so things that require uh, conviction disclosure requirements. So those impacts are lifelong. In education, school boards, I've served on school boards for 30 years. Can, school boards continue to respond in a qualitatively different manner to cannabis purely on the basis of its illegal status. So I've seen a number of young people whose cannabis use has come uh, to a board for disciplinary purposes. Uh, where they continue to be either stood down, suspended or excluded when those are generally not the options for tobacco or alcohol use. So there is a, a factor around its prohibition that means that boards are extremely uh, wary uh, in relation to the way that they discipline uh, young people. If you disconnect young people from education, obviously we know that's a major uh, life pathway disruptor, can lead to poor mental health, under-education, under-employment, uh, and, and is often a gateway to antisocial and offending uh, behaviours. I'll finish by saying there are some positives uh, to the uh, proposed uh, legalisation regime. That includes uh, not only social equity licensing provisions, um, 
So particular opportunities for Māori in a legalised market as growers, as licence holders, uh, guaranteed representation on the Cannabis Advisory Committee, which is the group that's tasked with setting setting THC limits, setting the limits of the amount of cannabis that's going to be released each year, um, and including making decisions about um, major policy aspects of the legalised market. There's also going to be preferential licensing uh, consideration for um, Māori communities and people that enter into partnerships with larger groups uh, by the Cannabis Regulatory Authority. Um, so some positives to come out of uh, potential legalisation, but mainly um, I would say that Māori continue to bear the brunt of the harms of prohibition. Many of those harms will either be eliminated altogether or mit potentially mitigated uh, with the legalisation of cannabis. But also a, a legal market provides significant economic opportunities for Māori, uh, which is a nod to self-determination or tēnaranga tiritanga, which we know is, of course, uh, affirmed in Article 2 of Te Tiriti o Waitangi. So uh, a number of different aspects from, from uh, Māori perspective. So um, uh, not perfect, but on the whole, better than what we've had. That, that's my assessment. Kia ora, Kali. That was nice within the time frame. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker. We have... Dr. Graham Gilbranson. Graham has over 30 years experience in general practice and has completed his fellowship in the Australasian chapter of addiction medicine. More recently, in 2018, he opened the Cannabis Care Clinic, providing specialist consultations for legal medicinal cannabis prescribing and has prescribed CBD to 1,400 patients. Welcome, Graham. Kia ora, tēnā koe kāli, tēnā koutou. Look, as doctors, we have a duty to advocate for our patients. And I wish to speak on a somewhat invisible group of our patients for whom I'm ticking yes. Around 5% of your adult patients may be using illegal cannabis for medicinal or healing purposes. The Legalization and Control Bill will regulate use or consumption. It does not specify the word recreational. Personal use includes medicinal use. The Cannabis Use Survey 2012-13 was published by the Ministry of Health online and in the NZMJ. Data was extracted from the regular New Zealand Health Survey sampling 13,000 Kiwis. They found that 11% aged 15 and over had used cannabis in the past year. This equates to about 400,000 Kiwis using illegal cannabis annually. Also of interest to me was that 42% almost half of cannabis users reported medicinal use, that is to treat pain or another medical condition. Those over 55 reported higher rates of medicinal use. So over 150,000 people report using cannabis for medicinal purposes in the past year. And for 40 years as a doctor, I've been asking patients if they use alcohol, tobacco and other drugs, like we all do. Patients tell me that cannabis is the only thing that relieves pain, anxiety, and insomnia. This is confirmed in the cannabis medical literature and in my experience as a cannabis prescriber for over three years. In my prescription cannabis practice, 57 of my last 200 patients were using illegal cannabis as medicine, almost a third. So why did they see me for prescription cannabis? Well, many live in constant fear of arrest confiscation of their cannabis medicine, risk to education, jobs, and travel. Most are concerned that they don't know what's in their illicit medicinal cannabis. They ask how prescription CBD or Sativex compare with the oils or herbal cannabis they use. Well, we just don't know because it's almost impossible to analyze illegal cannabis for its THC and CBD content. The strength of cannabis varies and it's not tested for contaminants like pesticides, heavy metals, solvents, fungi. Illegal cannabis supplies may be erratic and can run out, leaving the patient stranded. So patients ask you or me for prescription cannabis. And the barriers here relate to unwillingness of doctors to prescribe and Ministry of Health restrictions that block GP specialists applying for the less expensive but more effective blends containing THC. Yes, THC is medicinal, it's a partial agonist at the endocannabinoid systems of all animals, including us. This is a fundamental cellular signaling system of retrograde inhibition for immediate feedback, supporting homeostasis. 
think pain, anxiety, seizures where signals are amplified out of control and medicinal cannabis may bring them back to the normal zone. Cost is the other barrier for prescription cannabis, about $10 a day. So many start prescription cannabis but can't afford it and revert to illegal cannabis. As I've said, up to half of personal use is for pain, anxiety, sleep, etc., often for conditions not responding to standard medical treatment. There will always be patients with intractable conditions and many will find symptom relief with cannabis. They will keep using cannabis as medicinal regardless of its legal status. What I want for your patients and mine is safe access to cannabis when standard treatments fail. Government controlled cannabis sales would require products to be tested for contaminants and constituents and labeled just as with any other consumable item sold. I have no doubt that people will continue to use cannabis illegal or controlled. Cannabis has been with us for 10,000 years and is not going away. Prohibition has not stopped its use. Legalization and control make it safer for both medicinal and recreational use. You know, in Canada, at the time of legalization, just 35% were in favor. After 18 months of legalized cannabis, 70% support legalization. It is a better option. I ticked yesterday when I voted because I know it will be safer for over 150,000 people who use cannabis as medicine. Thank you for listening. Nga Thank you, Graham. Well done as well. Our next speaker, our final speaker for this evening is Dr. Buzz Burrell, a rural GP in Marlborough and senior lecturer for the Department of General Practice at Otago University with a wealth of experience in chronic persistent pain. He chairs the Royal New Zealand College of GPs rural chapter and was on the Ministry of Health Medicinal Cannabis Advisory Committee 2019. Welcome Buzz. A lot of greetings and uh, a very warm welcome to everybody listening and thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. I'm respectful of the fact of two things. I've only got five minutes. I'm also the very last speaker, so I'll try and respect both. I think to me, the most important thing is that we as doctors are probably advising our patients as to which way to go. And just to remind everybody, we're talking about the bill. This isn't a discussion about cannabis. This is a discussion about the bill. And I do thank Adam for reminding us exactly what the bill is about. And I find the public are confusing three issues. I'm going to try and touch on all those three issues. And I'll touch on them not only by their title, but also I'll try and throw some evidence in as well, because that's important that we respect that. So the three issues are being confused. One is the concept of medicinal cannabis. The other is the concept of decriminalization. And last but by no means least, is the commercialization of the selling of it. And those three are being blended into one and then blissfully confused. So let me just pick those three out and then pick on the last one because that's probably the most important part of the bill. I'm just gonna, no, just no disrespect to any prescriber, Graham, your, your compassion is beautiful and I really respect you for that. But medicinal cannabis hasn't completed phase one trials yet. I really challenge any doctor to prescribe a medication which hasn't completed phase one trials and not really dread the class action 20 years from now when the unexpected unintended consequences come forward. And it goes to one thing, but think um, regular beta agonists, think Adifax, think Vioxx, think, for God's sake, thalidomide in the late 50s, available over the counter in Germany. So we need to learn from evidence and experience. So medicinal cannabis is interesting, but when it's used as an argument for this bill, it needs to be shoved to one side. This bill is not about medicinal cannabis. Likewise, unfortunately, a small part of this bill is about decriminalization. And this is where my opinion gets uh, really, really focused. If the bill was about decriminalization, absolutely, completely, yes. But decriminalization is really important. And I 100% agree with what Kylie said, everybody else has said, to turn drug addicts, um, into criminals is wrong. They're patients. Now, if we decriminalize, they stop being addicts, they stop being criminals, they become patients, we can treat them. The evidence certainly in Portugal where they decriminalize and then pour an awful lot of resources into drug and alcohol research and help was really important. Lovely article in the um, Journal of Criminology in 2010 showed that Portugal, after that legislation was passed, had the lowest cannabis and drug use in the whole of the EU. Really important. So if this bill was only about decriminalization, it would be a no-brainer. Absolutely go for it. Uh, and and that, or every argument we've heard about prohibition and everything else absolutely stands and I totally back it. My concern is the commercialization of it. 
where we're going to actually support a multi-billion dollar for-profit industry. Now, that's where it goes wrong. And again, now let's look at the evidence. And I really thank Mary for introducing the concept of evidence because evidence is important. Anecdotes are interesting, but evidence is really important. And I'm looking at my clock and thank God I've got two minutes to fly through them. So let's look in America in particular. We'll look at Colorado, Alaska, Oregon, and Washington State. Now, all of these um, legalized. They went for the multi-billion dollar commercialized, let's make money out of people and let's see where we go. And here we go, youth. Youth use of, of cannabis increased 65% in the age 12 to 17 age group. And this is legislation which banned it under the age of 20. The um, Oregon did a random inspection of 66 places, which were selling it according to law, which was as about as solid as ours is. Out of 66, 16 were openly selling it to the people between 12 and 17. ED presentations. Now, Colorado, not bad, only a 35% increase in ED presentation directly associated with cannabis use. But try Oregon, 2,000% increase in ED presentations associated with cannabis use alone. Let's look at crime. 11 times faster the rate in Colorado since legislation was introduced. Alaska also reported an increase in use. What about road traffic accidents? Fatal crashes are directly attributed to cannabis increase in 88% in Colorado. What about health, lung issues, cardiovascular issues, and of course, Mary pointed very correctly to the risk of pregnancy all increase. What about social harm? 13% increase in homelessness in all four states. Um, so the, um, and what about the shops? Now in Colorado, we had more cannabis stores opened than McDonald's and Starbucks combined after the legislation was increased. I think if we just ask ourselves, are we supporting a multi-billion dollar industry which is gonna really try and make a huge profit out of it? And those profits, believe me, are not gonna go back drug and alcohol research and rehab. They're gonna to go to line the big profits of the gangs which are doing it already. They're gonna move out of the black market into shops. Are we gonna support that? Or shall we oppose this legislation saying, nice try, but you just tried too hard and it's gone too far. Let's stick with decriminalization. That's where our focus should be. That's where energy should be. And that's where our argument should be, not on the legalization of it, which translates to the commercialization of it, which will see more harm than good. So that's where I'm coming from. Decriminalize, yes. Commercialize, no. So nice try, government, but the drafting was wrong. And that's where I stand. And that's five minutes, 16 seconds. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Buzz. As you can see, everyone struggled to get all that they want to say in that short space of time. Um, so we'll move on to question time now. Um, and I also would like to introduce a Gray who's just popped up on screen. Um, he is also available to answer questions. Abe has a master's degree in botany from Otago University and has been a long time advocate for the legalization of cannabis. He has an extensive knowledge about the chemical components of the cannabis plant and laws overseas, and he is founder of the New Zealand Cannabis Museum. So first up, Mary, this one's directed at you. Could you please comment on the status quo? Cannabis is in the community already. Um, and it's not a good scene from a, I can, I can speak from a, a GP perspective. Um, and it's not good. Um, I've got a number of patients who I see on a regular basis who are lacking motivation, energy, the ability to do to to work. They knock off their dope for a while, and their whole you know they can even see it in themselves. They just feel so much better. And I think there's no doubt that the that just leaving things as they are is bad enough. But I don't think that legalising it is going to make better. There will be undoubtedly people are going to condone it it's okay mum and dad are sitting you know having a couple of tokes in the lounge it's okay for us to do it why can't I have one mum you know yeah that's my take on it would anyone else like to comment on the status quo what are the harms of keeping status quo Kylie I think you've already addressed that um, some of the risks um, haven't you? Okay. I think, yeah, I think the main thing I would just reiterate is to say that all, all of the harms you've spoken about there are the harms that have occurred while while the while cannabis is, is unlawful. So we're not talking about, uh, you know, some kind of bi binary opposition of a, a legal market um, versus an illegal market. There is a market now. It is it is an illegal one and it causes immense harm. So from my view, the only, the only question is, I mean, the same question that Mary posed, which is, is is it going to get any better or worse? Um, and, and in my view, I think on balance, it, it 
placing some restriction around it has got to be better than the current um, the current completely unregulated. Um, Carly, I'm going to accept here. You've asked a very good question. Thank God Colorado and Alaska have answered that question for you. Yes, it does get worse. So uh, that's the art of science. That's what we do as scientists. We ask a question and we look at the evidence and what does it tell us? But you're absolutely right. That the trouble is that at the moment, people are criminals and they should not be criminals. They're patients, they've got a problem and we need to be compassionate and sympathetic to that. In addition to which at the moment, they're paying for it in the black market. And if we imagine the black market is a shop, that very same shop has got in its shelves P, heroin, LSD, and any other drugs of abuse, again, completely unregulated and cut to God knows what with anything they can think of. So decriminalize it, take it out of the hands of the gangs, take them out of prisons and put them in drug and rehab centers instead. Then we can actually start helping them. Um, you're very right. Change the shop, legalize the shop, illegalize the shop. It's still the shop. They'll be paying money for it and that's money they can ill afford. So really, this legislation is wrong. The idea is naive and it's cute, but taking too far. Or maybe not. Uh, I I just you know, like to get a word in edgewise on behalf of the users themselves, because quite often when we hear about cannabis, um, it's through a pathologized lens. We only hear about people who went to prison or presented to the hospital. And, you know, the numbers that we're hearing, while they are numbers, they're very small numbers in comparison to the 400,000 regular cannabis users or 150,000 medicinal users. So the pathologized uh, narrative of cannabis is really the tip of the iceberg and the widespread use of cannabis in our society is largely responsible adults who aren't facing the extreme harms or, or using cannabis in extreme ways. That's important to note. And this over-focus on the pathologi pathologization of cannabis use uh, can lead us to do things where the, the cost can outweigh the benefit when we're really only looking at a small group of the users and the harms to them and not the wider harms to the whole group of users. Abe, your point is well made. Um, However, I if, just, we, yeah. but if we I go for coronavirus, then that doesn't actually follow. Sorry, carry on. Can I just direct this at Adam? Because he's pointed out right from the beginning that this is not a binding referendum. There's room to for this um, bill to move through the law process and be changed. Is it possible, Adam, for this a majority yes vote to then lead to de decriminalisation without... Okay, Shelley, it's certainly possible uh, that change could be made. I think it becomes less of a legal question, more of a political question. If you if you have over 50% of the population um, voting yes for a piece of draft legislation that exists, we can go and look it up online. Um, whether that's an informed yes or not, and the, there's a real question around that, um, nonetheless, it will become... Um, challenging for a, a government of any stripe to fundamentally change the policy settings that were proposed by way of that draft bill. So it, absolutely we could step down over the following a yes vote from legalisation to decriminalisation and, and I would expect that there would be a very vigorous public debate through the select committee process from, from some um, people to support that movement. But uh, it's a very uncertain way to develop public policy. So, uh, and, and I'm not expressing a view one way or the other, but if, if you were in the camp that you thought that decriminalization um, was the best, then it's certainly going to be more likely that you will end up at that end point if that's what you're proposing for the vote rather than legalisation. Uh, and, and certainly if we have a Labour Greens government, uh, I would have thought it would be pretty challenging to shift from what we've got um, in the draft bill at the moment. All right, thank you, Adam. I do want to move along to the next question. I, I think it's important to point out just from what Adam said that, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, the only outcome that will definitely lead to any select committee process is a yes vote, where a no vote is likely to see the issue shelved. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in that way, it's a similar uh, sort of set of conceptual problems to the end of life choice uh, referendum, where, you know, you have a proposal, you might agree with some aspects of it, but not the overall proposal. But if there is a no vote for uh, either cannabis or the end of life choice, um, 
just from a, a, a political reality standpoint, you, you've got to acknowledge that it's going to be off the table for a decent period of time after the vote. Thank you. Next question. Will legalisation provide financial benefit to the health system through taxation? Does anyone know the answer or is this something that we're... Uh, I, I can quickly explain that. So in the bill as it's drafted now, there's an excise tax and there's a levy. Taxes go into a general pool that uh, basically can end up used for anything, regardless of you know the best intentions of the authors. Levies can be sort of ring fenced and, and proscribed for specific applications. And so it's been proposed that the levy on cannabis be set at so many dollars per gram to go specifically to uh, increase funding for mental health interventions. Good luck with that. I think we saw $2 billion promised mental health directly to primary care, and none of my colleagues have seen one cent of it. So um, I really wish the very best of luck with the watching the journey of that dollar from the pocket of the user to us. Can I make just one comment? I mean, the evidence overseas shows that tax revenues from cannabis legalisation have been disappointingly lower than anticipated, in some cases up to 50% lower. So I think that it's a bit of a fantasy. And again, this is it. We've got the rest of the world are our guinea pigs. And I think we're in New Zealand are in a great position to say, let's sit back, watch, see what happens. You know, I would love to be proved wrong if in 10 years time, countries who've legalized marijuana are all doing absolutely well, brilliantly. We say, right, let's let's learn from this. But the evidence so far does not support that. We've got to look at that. That's what we do as doctors. We have to look at the best evidence that's available at the time. And the best evidence at the moment is not showing that legalization is reducing harms uh, in any way, shape or form. So it, it is important to distinguish between a tax, which can go to a general purpose, and a levy, which can be mandated. And I think it's also important to note that Colorado has legalized over-commercialization, which is very different to what's proposed in this bill, for eight years. And despite the statistics that uh, are not peer-reviewed and are not included in the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor report that Mary cites, uh, the sky has not fallen in in the last eight years in Colorado. In fact, uh, when you go to Colorado, the only signs that you can see outwardly of cannabis legalization are massive economic development. Thank you. I'm going to do the next question. We'll move on because I can see four minutes left. Um, Graham or A, can you briefly talk about CBD versus THC to answer the question in conversation about earthquakes? About what? About what? Earthquakes? Sarah, birth weights, it says. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, is, it, is it to do with um, uh, IUGR, small for dates, babies? There was, sorry to butt in here, there was a uh, comment, a question that came up earlier about um, birth weights and other harmful effects in utero, and has this actually got anything to do with CBD, or are we talking about combined products? Well, what, what I will say, and, and I'd love to hear what Graham has to say about this, because he, he may know better than I, but um, there's this idea that, you know, THC is the bad drug cannabinoid and CBD is the uh, non-harmful medicinal cannabinoid. That's a, a gross oversimplification. Um, there's 144 cannabinoids in the plant and about 30 human endocannabinoid receptors that we know of today. And so all of the promise of cannabis, all of the anecdotal effects of cannabis are not anecdotes. They're real physiological effects. We just haven't been able to explain them yet because we haven't been measuring all the cannabinoids and we haven't mapped out the entire endocannabinoid system yet. So when it comes to prenatal effects of cannabis, the, the research is very thin. The, the studies are few, the numbers are small, and they're not highly peer-reviewed. And when it comes to cannabis as a science, we're still learning a lot about it. But it is the very first plant ever grown for agriculture by humans, and we have been using it for 12,000 years. So, you know, massive mortality or toxicity has not really been a feature except in the newspapers in the last 30 years. So if, if we legalize and reduce the stigma, I think uh, women uh, and families are more likely to talk about cannabis use during pregnancy 
We heard about intrusion of various bodies of the state and people are keeping this as a secret. We need to get this out in the open, destigmatize it so that people feel free to talk about the use of cannabis. My experience as a GP is that people don't hide it at all. People are more than comfortable telling me that they're using dope. When I ask about smoking, they'll say, oh, I don't smoke tobacco, I smoke cannabis. So I don't think there is this big sort of secretive thing out there at the moment even. People are more than happy to talk about its use. That they don't want it. wins and sifts to know about it. Absolutely. And I suppose on that, um, on that note, um, if we're aiming for smoke-free New Zealand, then why are we allowing smoking of cannabis? Well, that's another important legal distinction. And, and I'd be happy for Adam to chime in if he, if he knows a bit about this as well. But smoke-free 2025 is not about criminally prohibiting tobacco, nor is it about prohibiting personal use of tobacco or even cultivation of tobacco. What Smoke Free 2025 is about is ending commercialization of tobacco. So in fact, Smoke Free 2025 proposes regulating tobacco as stringently as cannabis is regulated in this bill. So in fact, they completely complement each other and harmonize public health best practice in our legislation when it comes to two of the most popular intoxicants, only alcohol would remain to be included at that point. Thank you, Abe. And Doug, perhaps final question. Um, can you comment on the self-treatment of cancer in palliative care uh, or just the idea of self-medication overall? I'm, I'm not an oncologist, but I'm aware that there, there have been studies of people in oncology who have been self-prescribing cannabis and found it very useful. Um, and we've had some, um, you know, quite uh, public figures, um, Martin Crow and, 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 and others. Um, I, my, my final comment would be that a lot of alcohol currently is being drunk medicinally. And, and I think the same will be for cannabis. Um, the, these are these are drugs that go way back into our antiquity um, that are used for pleasure and comfort and they're part of human technology and we shouldn't be so afraid of them but we've got to think much more about the harms of alcohol and not be frightened by the scaremongering uh, that's going on with the moral cr crusade around cannabis. All right, well, it's, eight, it's after eight o'clock now, so although questions remain, it is now time to bring this webinar to a close. We always knew that one hour would be a real challenge to get all the messages across, but I hope you feel we have started to become more informed. I'd like to warmly thank all of our panellists this evening, Adam Holloway, Doug Selman, Mary Daly, Kylie Quince, Graham Gilbranson, Buzz Burrell, and the additional thanks to Abe Gray uh, for answering questions tonight. I'd like to also acknowledge the voices we have not heard tonight. Importantly, we have not heard a specific representation for Pacifica voices, and we have not heard from health professionals working internationally where cannabis has been made legal. Our final slide offers a link to the Office of the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor, where a summary of the evidence can be found. Please screenshot this and get more informed. It seems that this is a real balance of um, weighing up determinants of health and well-being, law, justice, employment, health. Um, and so I urge you all to get yourself more well-informed and good luck for voting in the coming weeks. Thank you to everyone for listening, to all our speakers, to Mobile Health and my support team in the wings. Thank you, Dr. Sarah Clark. For now, good evening. Good night, God bless everybody. Cheerio. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Money.